By praying in faith, a believer demonstrates that they know the God who they're praying to. And they know that God is sufficient and they know that God is able to do anything uh, according to his will and power. So it's not about the amount of faith we have that our prayers will work, but rather the object of our faith. You know, there's times that even if our faith is small and our faith is little, but if we place that faith in God, he can do great things. God can take a small measure of faith. But if we place that faith in him rather than placing that faith in ourselves, he can, he, by his great power, he can do anything that he desires. We've been studying through the book of James here for the last uh, probably 13, 14, 15 Sundays. And we had the theme of it be restoring devotion. Restoring devotion and looking at wisdom from the book of James. But really a secondary uh, title for the whole series of Sunday School lessons could have also been Real Faith. Because each week in the lesson we've been looking at something that faith does. And some effect that faith will have in our life. Uh, we've talked about how faith submits and faith waits. And today we're going to talk about faith praise. And we've been going over these things for several weeks. Because the book of James emphasizes how uh, faith is seen by our works. Faith is demonstrated by our works. And Faith obviously ought to have some effect in our life, and of course that's been on my heart much for several months. And so it's the theme we've chosen to uh, want to emphasize here in 2023, that we want to have a real faith. Not only are we looking for something real, and I found it in the Lord Jesus Christ, but He also wants that faith to be real in our lives, that it's seen by the world, it's seen by others. And uh, faith should change us and make us into what God wants us to be. We're going to talk this morning about faith praise, faith praise. Prayer connects us to God, which is the basis of our faith, is Him, of course. Just as faith changes the way that we handle our resources and how we endure suffering, faith will change the way that we communicate with God. It changes our relationship, for sure. Prayer is faith in action. Prayer is showing that we trust God. Prayer is showing our need for Him and our dependency upon Him in our life. And the life of prayer demonstrates true dependency on God and trust in the Lord and seeking Him in our life. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll read our text verses. Heavenly Father, would you speak to us this morning? Uh, give me wisdom as I speak that, and a discernment, Lord, to maybe say what you'd want me to say and not say anything that I should not say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's look there at our text verses beginning in James chapter 5. In verse number 13, James chapter 5 and verse 13, the Bible says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms or songs. Is any sick among you, weak among you, and so on? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias, and that's the Old Testament prophet uh, Elijah and so on. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do, do err or err from the truth, uh, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Again, prayer is what connects us to God. What does James call on us to do in spite of our trouble, in spite of maybe if we have afflictions or trials or troubles that we go through? He calls us to pray. What, he call, what does he call on us to do, even if we're married? Uh, sing psalms and to, to praise the Lord even. He calls us when we're sick or when we're weak or when we're struggling. He calls us to pray. Whenever we pray, whenever we even praise God through the, through the uh, avenue of prayer, 
We are showing God that we love Him. We're worshiping Him. We're showing God that we trust Him. As we better understand God's sovereignty in the world and God's sovereignty in our lives, we find ourselves reaching out to Him more and seeking His help and expressing joy in relating to Him. We recognize that He is interconnected with every part of our lives. And because of this, we can approach Him with, with things that are big, with things that are small, with big troubles, with little problems, anything we need in our life, we can approach to God and seek His help. Jesus Christ urged his disciples in John chapter 15 that they were to abide in the vine. And he says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. And we're to be abiding in him in order to have that uh, sustaining life that he can give us and to bear the fruit that he wants in our lives. In your uh, lesson outline there, write this, motives for prayer. Motives for prayer. So write this in your notes, motives for prayer, motives for prayer. And we want to read the verses here again, James chapter 5 and verses 13 to 16. It says, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Verse 16, Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Oftentimes people only approach God in prayer when things turn really rough or when things turn really bad. During the good times, people tend to not look for God as much. Well, they maybe don't feel as much as a need for Him. Everything's going good. But you know what? God wants us to turn to Him and look to Him in the good times and the bad times. We many times, we think that we have everything in our life under control. And we only realize that we don't have everything under control when something happens to maybe shake us a little bit or some trouble comes or some difficulty happens. And when those things remind us that we don't have everything under control, that's when we tend to seek God the most. But it ought to be in our lives that we would not just seek God in the bad times or when we feel I really, really need him, but all the time. We should depend on God's power and wisdom rather than our own. And during those times, we can praise God in prayer for his blessings to us. Regardless of if our life is good or bad, we should pray. We should pray. What does God promise there in verse number 15? He promises that he'll raise up the sick and that he will forgive, uh, forgive sin. I want you to see that there. Modus for prayer. Let's write this in our outline. Bad times, bad times or afflictions, we could call it. I think I wrote a couple things there in the handout. What many times comes? So there can be bad times, there can be good times, and there can be times of sickness. Those bad times are the, the afflictions. It said that there is any among you afflicted. There's been an emphasis in, in the book of James. We saw it in the very beginning of the chapter, that these were, or the beginning of the book, that these were people that were going through afflictions. These were people that were going through trials. These were people that were, were being persecuted for their faith. They were Hebrews that had become believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and some weren't happy about that. So they were facing aff afflictions, temptations, testings, suffering, and so on in their life. And James turns again to this topic that he began uh, his letter to them with. James' audience could identify with many forms of suffering and affliction that was present in their lives. And the word that James uses here relates to the same suffering even that was endured by the prophets, described back in verse number 10. These are the afflictions or maybe some ongoing trials that may test our faith and require God-given patience in order to withstand it. And we learned in chapter 1 that the way to patience sometimes is through the trials. And God teaches us patience as a result of that. So we have the bad times or afflictions. We have good times. We have good times, which could be uh, merriment or happiness. It's, it's when, when, when everything's merry, when everything's good. In contrast to the times of suffering and gloomy times that seem to dominate, James assures us here that, of course, there will be happy times, times of, of merriment and so on in our life. And praising God during those times is an appropriate response for, hey, when, when, when things are merry, when things are happy, when things are, are, are good. 
What is, what is praise? Praise is a form of worship, worshipful prayer that honors God. In the book of Psalms, the writers formed their prayers as songs. Psalms was songs, and it was these, these psalms or songs of praise many times that were, were, were God-given, but they were praise to God, coming from the heart of David and Asaph and others that God uh, used to write them. Both supplication, both us bringing our petitions and our requests and asking God for things, and also our praising God. Uh, they, they both of those acknowledge God's sovereignty, and we recognize God's involvement, and we thank God for His goodness and blessings uh, uh, during those times. So when we seek Him, when we praise Him, all of those are ways that we acknowledge God in prayer. How many of our prayers contain praise? Think about that for yourself. How many of your prayers contain praise to God? We should praise Him when we pray. Why does it seem natural at times to reach out to God in times of suffering or bad times, yet may be difficult to praise God and thank God in the good times? Maybe one of the reasons is that when things go well, we tend to credit ourselves. We take the credit ourselves. If the reason why things are good is because somehow it's you know, something I've done good in my life or I deserve this or whatever. And we maybe don't give, give God the appropriate praise and, and, and glory and so on that He deserves during those times. We only realize our limits and our weaknesses and so on when we're faced with difficulty and trials and troubles. But in our passage, James focuses on two general responses to God's sovereignty, that being of, of interceding and intercession or praying and re requesting and asking and petitioning God and also uh, praising God. We see there are times of uh, bad times, good times, and times of sickness. Times of sickness. Now, times of sickness here can refer to physical sicknesses, but it could also be times even where a person has some spiritual sickness. Spiritually, they're sick. Spiritually, they're weak. James narrows his focus on suffering to sickness in particular. Many people will turn to God when faced with illnesses, especially persistent illnesses or serious illnesses. For example, is it a natural Though some of you know already that my, my sister has been in hospital the last few days. And she's been sick over a period of weeks and we've prayed for her. But I promise you, to be, just be honest, right? I've prayed for her much more in the last few days since she went in the hospital than I was praying for when she was sick over the last few weeks. And it's just natural. Our tendency is to pray more in those times of, of sickness and so on. Physical problems, they remind us of our human frailty. And despite doing all we can, often our health problems are, are they're, they're out of our control. And we come face to face with the truth that we need someone that is greater than us to heal us or to help us in those situations. In these times, James urges believers not to, not to suffer alone, but to uh, request others to pray with you. As Christians, we belong to a church of people who share the same kinds of hardships and trials and difficulties. We all go through things. But we also have the same hope and we have the same helper. We have the same Lord and God who is able to help us. While people in the church can sympathize and have compassion one for another and show us that we're not alone in our trials, and we, we have sometimes trials that we mutually share, we, we've gone through similar things, but we can have compassion for one another, but that, and that support helps us, and it strengthens us in our, our endurance and so on. But ultimately, our dependence has to be on God, and we have to seek God in prayer for His help, because many times, He's the only one who can change a situation. He's the only one who can make a difference. We can pray for doctors and God to give doctors wisdom, but sometimes things are even out of the doctor's hands. And we just have to ask God for, for help and for His will to be done and a miracle to heal if, if that would be His will. You know, prayer is one specific way that the church can and should help other believers. We can request the spiritually mature to join us in our petitioning or our pleading with God or asking God for healing or for help. And God promises that that kind of faith will be rewarded. Well, first glance at the scripture seems to indicate that James primarily refers to physical he healing. He also, I think, is James is instructing the believers that they should pray for a type of spiritual healing as well. When you look at all of those verses right down through the end of the chapter, we see a lot of mention of spiritual need in a person's life. Spiritual sickness, spiritual weakness in a person's life. And God can provide physical healing when we uh, pray in faith and if it be His will. And He can restore someone to wholeness. 
But we know there's also times where God in His wisdom allows people to go through a certain trial or maybe does not heal a person in their sickness. And, and God is God. We don't understand at times why God may allow a loved one to suffer or even to, to pass away. However, we can take comfort that no matter what, God ultimately in heaven restores the believer. And if you have someone that suffered with a sick body in heaven, their body will be made perfect one day and they'll never be sick again. We thank God for that. Here in the context, let me, let me not get ahead of myself there. Remember here that, that James was writing to some people that were experiencing great testings of their faith. Um, remember that as we read the verses. They were going through testings and trials and difficulties. Their faith was really being challenged. And keep that thought in mind when we look at the verses again. James 5, 14 to 16. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults, your weaknesses, your problems, your things you're struggling with. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. Spiritual healing. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In the context then of trials and temptations, James offers his instruction to those who are discouraged in their faith. The word translated as sick in James 5 also gets used sometimes in others of, of Paul's letters and Paul's epistles. And sometimes a similar Greek word was translated weak or faint. And, and, and this weakness can certainly be physical, but it can also refer to spiritual frailties and, and spiritual weakness and spiritual sickness. The idea of one who may easily stumble or fall. Listen, if we're weak or we're struggling in our faith, it is good to confess that weakness and to ask mature Christians to pray for us uh, to be strong and to overcome that and to be healed and to be restored and to, to become what God wants us to be, maybe in that area that we're struggling with. As James instructs believers to patiently endure trials, he may be acknowledging here that sometimes people do even fail or fall. But we as Christians ought to pray for them that when they, when they fall, they wouldn't fail, they'd get back up again and they'd keep on going for the Lord. You know, we, we all as Christians, we fall sometimes in our faith. And we do things we shouldn't do. We let God down. But we can be restored and we can be spiritually healed and we can be right with God and go on and go forward for God. And we ought to pray for those matters seriously as well. When we take matters into our own hands or just grow weary and give up, we no longer endure our trials by faith. We may turn away from a wise, sovereign God and rely on ourselves, thereby putting ourselves in God's place. At best, we let our fear and self-wisdom make us forget God's truth. At worst, we may commit sinful idolatry by sacrificing our pursuit of God in order to pursue our personal comfort. Earlier in chapter 1, we saw James' warnings against uh, double-mindedness. Uh, a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways, it says. A lack of wholehearted devotion to Christ... That's double-mindedness. Well, we love the, love the Lord, but we also kind of love ourselves a whole lot, too. We love the Lord, but we also kind of love the world a whole lot. And, of course, we want to be restored in our devotion to the Lord, in our single-heartedness in following the Lord, not being a double-minded person. In chapter 5, James emphasizes, again, a focus on God in response to our weaknesses. Only through faith and prayer can we find a solution to even our sin sicknesses. We won't find one if we waver between trusting God and trusting in ourselves or the world. What kind of prayer specifically will heal the sick? What's going to make a difference? It's going to be how you say it. It's, it's going to be a prayer of faith. There's got to be a prayer of faith. What is needed is faith. What makes the difference is faith. What gets prayers answered is, is faith. Combined with God's power and ability and God's will, right? What God can do and what God wants to do. So, so if, if what is really needed is faith, why does James mention anointing with oil? The mention of anointing is, is difficult to understand without some cultural knowledge. Some people have, have mistakenly interpreted this command to mean that the anointing oil somehow in and of itself possesses some mystical he healing properties. 
And it wouldn't just be that anointing with oil on the forehead that that is, boy, that, that's God, that has mystical powers. That has miracle powers. What, what, what God responds to and what makes God do miracles is faith. Faith. Not that we can find some super potion or some special miraculous oil and rub it on somebody's head. What will make God answer prayers or if God wants to do a, a miracle in healing physically or spiritually or whatever the case may be, is going to be faith. Faith makes the difference. James makes it clear. It's, it's not necessarily the oil that would heal a person, nor even the prayer that heals a person, but a person's faith that God sees in their heart and that God is responding to. God provides healing to those who approach Him with faith, believing that God has the ability, God has the power, God has the wisdom, and God is good that if He so chooses, He can heal. He can heal. It will be faith that brings healing or restoration or whatever is needed in our life. When we get discouraged or struggle to believe God, we should call on the spiritually mature uh, to pray with us and to pray for us. We should spend time in prayer together, sharing our burdens and lifting each other up uh, for healing. And James mentions there even confession as a, a key to, to healing. Prayer provides re a refreshment, enabling the weak to rise up and live each day with renewed hope in Jesus. Jesus Christ. Next thing in your notes there is this, the focus of prayer. The focus of prayer. What's the focus of prayer? Well, the focus of prayer is who our prayer should be directed to, right? Our prayer needs to be directed uh, to God. In James chapter 5 and verse number 15, it says, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Who do we pray to? We pray to God. He is the focus of our prayers. James doesn't simply tell us to pray. He specifies that we should, uh, that we should pray in faith. This faith isn't directed uh, at the prayer itself, but it's directed to God, the one who has the power to do something. The one who has the ability to change things. Prayer isn't simply some magical us chanting a certain prayer. Yeah, yeah. No, prayer is us talking to God who has the power to do miracles according to his will and desire and goodness. Prayer isn't something to just try to manipulate God, uh, but to seek his will. Prayer is a channel through which we express our faith in God's promises and in the, the character and the goodness of God. So we see the focus of prayer, and there needs to be, uh, in, your, in your notes there, faith in the God who hears prayer. Faith in the God who hears prayer. By praying in faith, a believer demonstrates that they know the God who they're praying to. And they know that God is sufficient, and they know that God is able to do anything uh, according to His will and power. So it's not about the amount of faith we have that our prayers will work, but rather the object of our faith. Do you know there's times that even if our faith is small and our faith is little, but if we place that faith in God, He can do great things. God can take a small measure of faith. But if we place that faith in Him rather than placing that faith in ourselves, he can, he, by His great power, He can do anything that He desires. So it's not about the amount of faith we have that our prayers will work, but rather the object of our faith. When you pray, do you place your faith in the one to whom you pray? Write this in your notes. There, the result of prayer. The result of prayer. The result of prayer. How does James describe the prayer of a righteous person, a righteous man? It's powerful. It's, it's effective. It accomplishes much. The Bible words it there and says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It, it, can, it can accomplish much. It will be effective and fervent. God not only commands us to pray, but He also promises certain things uh, in return. The result of prayer in your notes there under that, you can write the word healing. Healing. The result of prayer under that healing. Notice these verses again, James chapter 5 and verses uh, 15 to 18. The Bible says, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. 
Verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias, Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. A prayer of faith is powerful because our God is powerful. Elijah the prophet lived under the rule of, of a wicked King Ahab. He did more evil than anyone in his time. And you'll find, you can read about them in the book of Kings and so on. The people of Israel were hardly better than Ahab at times, uh, forsaking God, turning their hearts away from God, sometimes turning to worship uh, other pagan gods and heathen gods and idols and so on. But in answer to the, the faith-filled prayer of this prophet Elijah, God sent a drought to demonstrate the power of the one true and living God. He had sent the prophet Elijah as a messenger to Israel, accusing them of idolatry and calling on them to repent and to turn to God to worship God alone. And God did this miraculous answer to Elijah's prayers, again, to try to get them to see who the true God was, who the living God was, who was the God who truly had power. But we see that the prayer of faith can be effectual. It can uh, bring healing. We also see that it can bring spiritual restoration. It can bring spiritual restoration there in your notes. Notice these verses, James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. It says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. James concludes his book gently, yet again addressing his audience as family in Christ. He does not condemn or shame the spiritually weak. Instead, he treats them with love and compassion. In the very same way, God views our weakness with compassion. Uh, he, has, he has a loving Father has pity on us, even in our weaknesses. He knows we're weak. He knows we're human. He knows we're frail. He knows we, we, we sin. He knows we're flesh. He knows we're going to blow it at times. We're not, we're not perfect individuals. We're not perfect Christians or perfect followers of God. We all at times are weak. We, we sin. We maybe fall to temptation. We do something we should not do. But God is ready to heal. He's ready to love. He's ready to forgive. He's ready to restore those who come to him in their weakness and in their frailty and in their sinfulness, seeking him. You know, 1 John tells us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What else does the Bible say? Back in the book of Psalms, chapter 103. Psalm 103 says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy, he will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. There are times where he just steps in in his mercy and in his forgiveness, uh, just seeking to restore us, even though in reality we wouldn't deserve it. But that's who God is. God loves. God always wants to restore us. He wants, you can be a believer, and 1 John is all about this, and we're going to get into this probably in the next uh, few months at some point, but you, if you're a child of God, He wants you to be able to walk in close fellowship with Him. If we blow it, He knows it. You know, you blow it, you mess up, He, he knows it. But again, if we just want to be right with Him, we can be. We can be if we'll confess our sin and turn to Him. He's loving and forgiving. He wants to restore us. When a believer grows weary and strays from the truth, the church should reflect the love of Christ and the compassion of Christ to them. If a Christian, now Christians, we fall all the time. That, that's, that shouldn't be shocking. Every one of us, 
We sin, we fall, we fail, we, like, we, we do things wrong all the time, right? We fall into temptation, we do things we shouldn't do, we, we at times are weak in our faith. Our faith isn't always like this great gigantic faith. Sometimes we're weak in our faith. But let's say there's other times where, where some of those weaknesses or sinfulness is seen a bit more publicly. You know? Something happens that your weakness or your sin, it, it's a bit more public. And it got seen by everybody. <laughs> or, or, you you know, you, you let off and you lost your temper and you started uh, being mean and unkind with some other Christian. Well, everybody had a chance to see your weakness right there and see you sin and do wrong. Right? Is that a chance for the church to just go, puh, puh, well, they're, they're terrible. <laughs> I hope I never see them again. They're off. Oh. What an awful Christian they are. What a wicked sinner they are. No, this is a chance for what's the church supposed to do? We're to always be about restoration. Church is to be a hospital restoring, healing the sick spiritually, right? We're to be restoring. We're to be wanting to. We should be spiritual enough that we're not, you, you, don't, you don't gossip about people's weaknesses. You pray for them and their weakness. And people ought to be humble enough that we even ask for people to pray with us. The idea of confessing your faults one to another is us ourselves admitting, I'm weak or I'm struggling. Or I'm, I'm in this area of my faith. I'm weak. I need help. Would you pray for me? And not just necessarily going to anybody, but going to those that are spiritual and so on, asking them to pray for me. That I'd get the victory in this area of my life, that my faith would be strong in this area, that I would overcome this. And a church ought to be ready to do this. A church, as we've seen in James, isn't just there to judge or to condemn. A church is there to love and restore and pray for people who are weak or pray for people who are even sick spiritually so that they can be restored and right with God and in right fellowship with Him and in right fellowship with other believers or whatever the case may be. That's to be a church, loving and showing the compassion, reflecting the love and compassion of Christ to other people. Just as God lovingly pursues those who turn their backs on him, so should Christians. You know, a Christian, just like in the story of the, of the prodigal and the lost sheep and so on. And God goes out seeking the lost sheep. The father is always looking for the prodigal son to return home. You and I as Christians should always be wanting if someone's gone astray from the Lord, praying for their return, looking for the return, wanting their, their return to the Lord if they've just you know, gone off some deep end, whatever. We don't give up on people who, who, who fall or sin. We, we seek the restoration. More than ever, the spiritually sick and wounded need comfort and they need truth and they need support and they need prayer. We must pray for their spiritual weakness and lovingly encourage them with the truth, all because we care for their souls. Not only does faith show up in our interaction with other people, it also is to show up in our interaction with God. Faith ought to shine through our prayers, expressing our dependence upon God and our acknowledgement that God is sovereign. Such a prayer requires knowing God's character. Chances are that you know a spiritually weak brother or sister who needs your love and who needs your prayers. Maybe you know some soul who's in danger, who desperately needs rescue. Will you pray for them to come to the Lord? When you find yourself uh, facing some trial or some temptation, will you pray? Will you pray? When you're afflicted, pray. Pray. When, when times are good and merry and everything's going well, will you pray and praise and thank and bless the Lord during those times as well? See, we ought to pray in bad times. We ought to pray in good times. We ought to pray in times of sickness or weakness. We ought to pray at all times. And prayer shows our dependence on God and our need for God and our recognition of God, our trust in God, our hope in God, our worship of God. Will you devote yourself wholeheartedly to God, relying on His wisdom to help you through everyday life? Pray for God's wisdom as you learn more of His character. Back in James 1, it told us, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Ask of God. We all need God's help. We all need God's wisdom. And we ought to be seeking Him in prayer. What does faith do? Faith prays. Faith prays. A real faith prays. Faith prays. 
As we've studied through the book of James, we've really had this secondary emphasis of, of real faith because we've seen many things that faith does. God laid that theme upon my heart really months and months and months and months ago, really. And there's, the scriptures have so much to say about it. There's, of course, key verses that challenge us to not have, an, have a feigned faith or one that's just uh, us wearing a mask, us, us being fake, us pretending, but being real. There's, of course, scriptures like that. But then you can go through entire uh, letters in the scripture, books in the scriptures that challenge us of, of, of what we're to be like as Christians, what our faith ought to be like and what others ought to see in us. And we're going to be talking about that uh, quite a bit more in the coming weeks. Even as we, in our morning service today, we're going to begin it. Because in our morning service, we've been, right, studying through the book of Romans. And we've just now are getting to the turning point. We're turning to Romans chapter 12. And we've seen in chapters 1 through 11 all of God's wonderful salvation. And how he, His salvation is for the whole world. It's for Jews and Gentiles. He wants to save anybody who will turn to Him and believe in His Son, the Messiah. The Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who can save us and cleanse us from all our sins and make us the children of God. But when, in chapter 12, we're going to see how that there's a life now that we're to live for Christ. Because of all that he's done for us, what should we do for him? And how should, how should God's grace change us? How should us having Christ in our life change us? We're going to begin to see a turning point. And so for the next few weeks in our Sunday morning services at 11 o'clock, we'll be studying Romans 12 and seeing how a real faith will kind of act itself out or demonstrate itself or how it will be lived out in our life. You know, the Bible teaches us that our our. our, our, our our salvation should be worked outwardly that others see it, you know. We don't, we don't work for our salvation or work out our salvation in the sense of working our way to heaven. But we, it, 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 God's grace and God's salvation and God's working in us works out and works outwardly that other people see there's something different. They've got Christ in their life. That somebody would be even be able to look at you and say they've got a real faith. They've got a real faith. I want that to be true in my life. I want that to be true in your life. I mentioned last week when we put up this banner for the first time and showed you, showed you this. I, I said, real faith doesn't mean perfection. Not at all. We're not here claiming, oh, we're, 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 we're perfect. Real faith isn't about perfection. Real faith is about redemption. And real, but real faith is about people who've experienced God's grace in their life and God's forgiveness in their life. We're imperfect and we're sinners, but I'm saved by the grace of God. And from glory to glory, He's changing me to make me more of what He wants me to be. But I want to be real faith. I want to have real faith. I want to be a real Christian. I want our church to be real and so on and, and all of these things. What does real mean? Authentic, genuine, I'm not looking sincere, true, without pretense, right? You ought to desire that in your life. We've seen that in James. What does faith do? I hope you'll desire this year and pray, God, I want my faith to be real. I want it to be authentic. I want it to be genuine. I want it to be sincere. I want it to be true. And I want it to be without any pretense. Pretense is the idea of, of putting on, pretending. I, I want it to be real. I hope you all desire to not only have what's real, but to demonstrate a real faith in your life. Next Sunday, we'll begin a new series of lessons in our adult Bible class. I hope you'll be here for that. And uh, God wants to do some great things in our lives. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for each one here this morning. I pray you'd uh, bless and work in each one of our lives. Grow us by your grace. Uh, grow us more and more into Christ's likeness. Uh, grow us to a place, Lord, if we've not even been saved yet, that we'll come to a place of being willing to take the measure of faith that Romans says you've given to us and be willing to place that in you. We live in a world that there's much humanism, there's all kinds of isms, and people many times have faith in themselves or faith in different things. But, Lord, may we take the measure of faith you've given us and learn to place it in the one true God, the one true creator of the universe, Jehovah God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, the God who made us, the God who loves us, the God who even came in the form of His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us, for our sins. 
so that we could be saved and forgiven and have a new relationship with him and have new life in Christ. I thank you for what you've done for me. God, please keep changing me. Help each one of us help our faith to be real and uh, to discover what is real and true, but then also to live out in our life what is real and what is true, what is authentic. God, thank you for what you've done in me. I love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Take time. We, it wasn't a real long lesson today necessarily. And uh, take time to uh, fellowship and so on. There's people around you here that maybe you've never met before. Go introduce yourself.